My next topic moves us to water. Clean and accessible water is without an argument a constitutional right. However, a number of external and self-imposed factors have positioned access to water as the third biggest risk of doing business in South Africa, and that's according to the World Economic Forum. I'm joined by Gundo Maswime, civil engineer lecturer at the University of Cape Town, and Kashif Isaacs, head of private markets at Mergent Investment Managers, to unpack the future of South Africa and its water challenges and opportunities. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me. Um, let's lay the picture of why we are considered to have such a high risk of water stability. What has brought us to this point? Uh, before we move on to what are some of the tangible solutions we are seeing coming up, perhaps we start with you, uh, Kashif. Give us an overview of the challenge we face. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so, one of the biggest input for us is that South Africa is actually the 30th driest country in the world. So another league table we don't necessarily we want to feature in, uh, but that's the, the reality. So and if you couple that with the fact that we've, we've seen in several municipalities that are unable to manage um, water effectively and deliver water to their communities, um, I think Hamans Kral is currently the biggest uh, evidence of that. Uh, but there are several other communities where citizens are wholly reliant on um, tanked water. There is no potable water supply. Um, and some of our municipalities lose up to half of their water between the bulk water metering point and the final consumer. If we are the 30th driest country in the world, we cannot afford to lose water before you know, between supply and, and our end users. And that's really driving the crisis in South Africa. And we're losing quite a lot of a lot of water. I mean, this is a very big percentage uh, from what leaves the municipality that gets to consumers. Uh, and then we've got climate change, and then we've got a very aging infrastructure. So perhaps, um, Gundo, you can lean into what does this then mean for us for the for the next coming uh, for the future? Uh, thank you. The, the important thing to focus on now is our investment on the infrastructure that uh, uh, takes water, as um, uh, uh, Kashif has said, from uh, where it's treated to, uh, to to the end point, which is by the, uh, uh, the receiver or the user. Uh, the challenge with that is we have got very old infrastructure, but we also have places where the infrastructure is lacking. So balancing between having to use uh, having to upgrade what we already have and ha having to extend uh, also and join a, a new consumers into the water network. I think that is the biggest challenge and I think that is where the creativity of our young people um, uh, comes in and the lessons that we can learn from other uh, BRICS countries. Mm. And indeed, the technology is all over that, that are solving for communities. Kashif, you know, when you look at it from a private market's perspective, it's difficult to have hope that the government is going to uh, enable easy solutions. When you look at that disjointed manner in which municipalities are working at a provincial, local uh, level, it, do, do, what are the conversations? Are we making inroads at streamlining? Because water has got no boundaries when it needs to reach people. Is progress being made in the private-public partnership? Um, unfortunately, not, not much progress. I think I mean, we, we have invested in South Africa's only two long-term water triple Ps, uh, which was entered back in 1999. Um, I mean, we, yeah, we've obviously been encouraging various stakeholders to try and replicate this model. I think South Africa has had some success in the renewable energy procurement program um, that's mobilized billions of rands from the private sector to try and, and bring renewables to market. And we, in our view, we need a similar program where there's close coordination between all the key stakeholders in government, national treasury, um, municipalities themselves, provincial government, uh, a coordinated procurement program that's going to mobilize the tens of billions of rands required to deliver the infrastructure we desperately need. You know, what's so overwhelming about this conversation is that we have an energy crisis that sits in one 
in one area. So it's, it's, it's energy, it's ESCOM. But now water sits all over the place. Um, and when you talk about only one triple P or two triple P since 1999, we're sitting in 2023, you know, this really shows really slow progress in a, in a much more big, in a bigger problem. So, so Gunda, from an engineering perspective, from a civil society and entrepreneur perspective, are there opportunities for leaps that are even better to counter this even bigger problem? Uh, yes, thank you. I, that you, You've just really touched on a very uh, important point, that um, the issue of water, our research uh, um, shows that the challenge of water is more of a, a challenge of governance, uh, more than it's a, a challenge of innovation, uh, because engineering science really um, could, could close most of the gaps. The challenge with water, which you have just put uh, succinctly, is that uh, unlike electricity, it does not really sit uh, in one place. There has been water schemes all over the place. And as you said, some of those water schemes, of course, because of um, their, their, their location, does not really respect uh, municipal boundaries. So the government now has um, uh, what they call a, a, a district development model, where they look at things now at district level, because you can have one municipality um, where there is no, um, there are no water bodies within uh, that municipality. They only rely on uh, the next municipality, uh, or the, you know. So for that reason, there has been an initiative to start looking at these resources um, in a in a more broader sense uh, and not limited to the political boundaries that have been demarcated for municipalities. But uh, also, which is an e a, an even bigger issue, is that. Until 1999, when the National Water um, Act came into uh, place, there was uh, the history of the country since 1910. Water has never really been a sole uh, responsibility of the government. And if anything, government played a lesser, a much lesser role than it plays now. Uh, initially, it was the agricultural uh, sector investing there. Then it became the mining um, uh, sector investing together with the agricultural sector. So when the New Water Act that focused on the household as the primary concern uh, when it comes to the supply of water, it looks like the business community had taken a back seat and now we can see that they are now starting to come in to say, we want to play a role because we are victims when this is not uh, uh, done properly. So there are some positive shifts that we are seeing and we are hoping that the government would take this opportunity and even learn from uh, our, our partners within uh, the BRICS uh, block to uh, to take those lessons forward. I would think so and hope so. Um, but Kasif, perhaps let's talk about the end part of Gunda's contribution around the importance of the private sector's uh, involvement. Uh, you you now have looked at this uh, the mergence investment via, via SAWW. Um, what have some of been the returns that you've seen? Is it too early for returns? But how is it performing as, as, a, as a private investment into a water solution? So I, I can't share the sort of specific returns. Um, it's obviously subject to confidentiality. Um, but we are very happy with how the assets, both assets, have performed. Um, you know, we've been, we acquired the controlling stake back in 2018, um, and you know, it, it's not without its challenges either. But uh, maybe let's let's focus on on some of the the positive features of the concession. So. For example, um, in, in one of them, we have a profit sharing model with the municipality. And as of last year, we hit the return hurdle for the private investor. And we have started sharing now profits with the municipality. And for each of the remaining five years of the concession, half of our profits above that hurdle is shared with the municipality. That creates capacity in the municipality to invest um, in hopefully further water or other infrastructure. Uh, we have also have South Africa's largest uh, black water recycling plant, where we're able to put 20% of waste uh, of the water supply um, for that area back into the system by recycling. So again, you know, we've, we've delivered on a number of innovations. Um, you know, the, the model works for both the municipality and for the private concessionaire. Uh, and there's an ability for, for the municipality to measure our performance independently. We actually pay a fee um, to, to create the capacity for the municipality to do that. 
So there's very robust features and, and quite a balanced you know, um, sharing of the risk between the operator and the municipality. And if you're seeing these positive features uh, you know, already at this point, surely now you're probably working on the next project. And if you are, where would that possibly be? Um, we are engaging with um, you know, various sectors of government. Um, but you know, one of the constraints we have to deal with is the current procurement framework. So typically, the uh, Municipal Finance Act allows a maximum tenure of a contract of about three years. Anything beyond that, you need to uh, involve correctly, in our view, National Treasury um, and various other ministries. Um, you know, so, so that's why we need to shift the way we procure um, to a longer term process. It's a bit like building a house, right? You, you have to pay all of the costs on day one um, and you pay your mortgage over, let's say, 15 or 20 years. It's similar in any infrastructure. We deliver all the infrastructure up front, whether that be a reticulation network, um, new connections for consumers, developers, businesses, and we need to recover that investment over an extended period of time. So that's the fundamental shift that's needed, is you know, shifting the way municipalities are allowed to procure um, water services and water infrastructure. Thank you. Uh, Gundo, you know, I find that universities uh, have quite a gap between what the country needs, uh, what investment markets um, are doing, and what is being done in the universities. Um, is this not an opportunity to bridge the gap, also considering that universities are quite a, a neutral partner in the private um, and, and public uh, uh, sector conversations? Is there an opportunity you see here that can help uh, South Africa to solve, especially for its water issues? Uh, yes, indeed, there is um, a lot of opportunities because universities have been um, conducting a lot of uh, research right across the uh, uh, water value chain. Uh, some, uh, is, uh, some of the research is related to, uh, to water conservation, uh, and there's a lot of other innovations that um, the, the academic fraternity has uh, put on the table. And I think it uh, it also follows closely uh, to what uh, Kashif has, has just made reference to, that we are now also doing research on the best way to the the, the best way to structure our um, um, the, our framework in terms of our legislative framework to be able uh, to to jump all these loops of procurement, which which was uh, not geared mostly towards uh, the built environment type or civil engineering uh, fraternity. It was geared towards just general procurement. So that's why our legislation talks about goods and services, but it, it doesn't talk about uh, works. This falls under, uh, under works. So this uh, initial capital investments uh, that come with it, we are able to model properly how long would it have uh, taken really for the private sector to feel that they will be able to uh, break even or to recoup um, their initial investment. But we are encouraged that there is the procurement bill, which is uh, now uh, in the consultative uh, stages. And we are now looking at it through the eyes of um, um, uh, civil engineering or in public infrastructure delivery to say, is it suitable? Is it going to take us to where the gap between the private sector and the government will be closed. So there's a lot of uh, research now that is looking at um, at uh, all of that. But the biggest challenge that we now need to face is the translatability of the research that comes from the universities. Uh, if the, uh, the, the, the government uh, system or legislation is too uh, rigid for it to take on new innovation, then it becomes a challenge. If somebody comes with a good solution to a, a water challenge, that person might just be having, uh, that might be the only um, company that has got that type of solution. In procurement, you are not allowed to specify um, any type, uh, any supplier or to put your, um, your scope of work in such a way that it favors any supplier. But in instances where that is the only supplier, those are the kind of things we are now starting to uh, conduct research on and seeing how can we absorb the uh, new innovations into um, uh, government uh, uh, processes. 
Well, thank you so much. I think I think I, I missed one more question around the availability of funding to, to actually back these procurement processes. But it's another conversation. We look forward to having it again. And I really want to thank my panel for their insights into this critical part of our econ economy, especially its future stability. That was Gundo Masuim, a civil engineer lecturer at the University of Cape Town, and Kashif Isaacs, head of private markets at Mergent Investment Managers.